sorry. You can post your questions in the chat. And again, just for the recording, I want to say that because uh, I already introduced him, but I want to introduce Paul Lucas, um, who is a nature and landscape photographer and an instructor at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Great. Thank you again. So happy National Nature Photography Day. Uh, and, and as we go along, if there are any questions, just, you know, pop them in the chat and uh, Jen will look at them and pause and, you know, I want to answer them so that we don't miss anything as we go along. So, so I just want to say, you know, welcome. My name is Paul Lucas. Uh, just real quickly about me. I've been very long been interested in nature and landscape photography. Um, two of my favorite nature and landscape photographers are Ansel Adams and Elliot Porter. And it was really Ansel Adams that got me interested in landscape photography. I found an old life magazine, probably at a library, and it had this beautiful black and white image of uh, uh, sunrise over New Hernandez, uh, Hernandez, New Mexico. And that's what kind of inspired me to get interested in uh, landscape and nature photography. And Elliot Porter, he originally was born in the Chicago area uh, in Highland Park, and uh, took color photography into that, into the world of nature and landscape photography. Before Elliot Porter, color photography wasn't really thought of as uh, part of the fine art photography world. And I've been, as, as Jen mentioned, I've been an instructor at the Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, I think going on four years now, and I taught three years previously at uh, the Morton Arboretum. So seven years uh, in total I've been teaching. So one thing I just wanna mention <clears throat> as we get rolling along here, is um, I believe that like photography, like you, you can believe, do photography anywhere and you can create really great images right in your own backyard. If you have the ability to travel and the budget and everything and go to cool locations, that's great. You can get awesome things, but you can create really great photography close to home. And we just have a, a wealth of riches in the area between our you know um, forest preserves of the different counties, DuPage, McHenry, Lake Cook County Forest Preserves, the Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, the Morton Arboretum, uh, uh, just on and on and on, Cantini. So there's all kinds of wonderful places to photograph around here. And in tonight's um, session, what we're going to do is look at some ideas on composition, because that's always a challenge for photographers. Like, how can I create interesting images? How do I start seeing like the camera? So we're going to concentrate and focus on some basic ideas around composition. And I'll say that uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, depending how far we get, I've provided a lot of extra material. I don't think we'll cover it all tonight, obviously, but most of it, the bulk of it, two thirds of it would apply to any kind of camera, whether it's a traditional SLR, a DSL, DSLR, uh, a mirrorless camera, your smartphone, a point and shoot, these kinds of composition ideas can be used with any kind of camera. So there's, it's not that you need any kind of special equipment. And I like to throw in a lot of quotes just for fun, you know, to make it interesting. And, and I always like this quote, quote by Edward West, and anything more than 500 yards from the car just isn't photogenic. So I really like that because I don't, I like to stay close. You know, I like to have to travel too far, backpack, and a lot of equipment or anything like that. So quick pop quiz. Nobody's got to answer this tonight. Uh, when I teach classes a lot of times at the Botanic Garden at the Morton Arbor, and I, I'd always say this, what's the most important piece of photog photographic gear, just to get people kind of thinking in a different mindset. And of course, people always say, you know, like, oh, a lens or, you know, uh, the body or something, whatever, the camera, you know, and, and it's not the equipment you are, the photographer is the most important piece of equipment. It's the ability to take your imagination, your skills and experience and thinking how I can look at something and what catches my eye? What grabs my attention? How can I take that and turn it into a photograph? How can I make that look you know, good through the lens of a camera? Because our, our, our minds are great at isolating things, but the cameras don't hide anything. They can't, they show whatever we see. And as an example, this is an image I took with my iPhone, oh gosh, I don't know, five, six years ago at the uh, Chicago Botanic Garden in the fall. And, and you can see it's a great image. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of nice color. If you didn't know, if I didn't tell you it's the Chicago Botanic Garden, you might think it's at you know, some uh, valley stream in a mountain area. So for those of you that have traditional cameras, I always like to say, how do you get the most from your cameras? You know, have your manual handy, read the manual, bring your manual along with you. And uh, you know, 
it, you don't need to read the manual from the beginning to the end. And even with your smartphone or your point and shoot, you do need to learn how some basic things about utilizing those, like where, how do I set a focus point? Like with a smartphone, typically you can just press on the screen on the subject that you wanna focus on and it will focus on for you. But a key thing is, you know, use the camera that you have with you. If it's a smartphone, a point and shoot, a lot of times I'm out for a walk. I don't carry, a, you know, one of my cameras with me. I do a lot of photography with my smartphone. Um, and you've already paid for, you know, developing your film, whether it's in your smartphone or your point and shoot camera or your DSLR or whatever kind of camera you have. Um, just practice, practice, practice. That's how you get to, you know, refine your eye, get used to how your, your camera sees the scenery and the image, getting used to looking through that frame of your camera. And ask me, you know, feel free to ask questions as we go along if there's anything that pops out. So uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson was a French photographer, uh, used a little simple viewfinder camera for many, uh, many, many years as a professional. And I like how he said, your first 10,000 photographs are your worst. So as I mentioned, you just really, really got to practice a lot. So we're going to transition, um, start some talking a little bit about composition. And I just want to mention there's lots of different ways to approach photography. So I'm just sharing with you the ideas and techniques that I've developed that I share with my students at the Botanic Garden uh, to, to help them think about, you know, how might they start uh, composing images, creating images with their cameras or smartphones or whatever it might be. And uh, Ansel Adams, he says, a good photograph is knowing where to stand. And that's kind of an important thing because you have to see that image. You have to see something. How do I frame it up in that viewfinder or the back of my smartphone? You know, maybe you want to move to the left. Maybe you want to move to the right. Maybe you want to get closer or farther back, you know, hold it above you or kneel down. So uh, that does help. Those are easy things to think about. Uh, and if you find a great composition, just don't, you know, and you take it in the, you know, a uh, portrait mode or a landscape, you know, take it in both modes, see what it looks like. Uh, so the last thing here, and we'll start jumping a little more into the compositions as Elliot Ur Erwitt said, uh, to me, photography is an art of observation. It's about finding something interesting in an ordinary place. I found it has little to do with the, the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. So again, you have to start using your imagination to kind of abstract out ideas. How do I create an image? I saw something that caught my eye. How do I create an image from that? How do I fit that in the frame of my camera and make it interesting? And uh, Prost said the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So again, that kind of reinforces this idea of like, how do I, you know, I see something, how do I make an image out of it? So a few years back, I was walking. Um, I live close to the Botanic Garden, um, and I go over there for a lot of walks. I'm walking on the outer drive. There's the inner part of the garden, but there's a drive that circles around the whole garden. And I noticed uh, Spider Island. Um, there was this reflection. It was late afternoon, uh, late November-ish, early November. And I noticed how the, the um, birch trees were uh, the, the image they were creating on the water, how the water had just the gentlest ripple to kind of make this abstract image. So it's really an image about colors and textures. And I didn't have my, you know, I didn't have any camera with my smartphone. So I went down, took a few image, few images, and, and this is the an image I created. So this is, you know, more of an abstract image. There's not a real defined thing. Again, like I said, it's about colors and textures. But it's like I caught that out of the corner of my eye as I was walking along because I had to walk down a slope to go take that, uh, that, that image. And then uh, last fall, I went out, uh, I was wandering around uh, Daniel Wright Woods and I found there's this little dam on the Des Plaines River. And it goes all the way across the river, but I thought like, well, how can I isolate it? What can I do to make an interesting composition and an image? Now, um, I did use a regular camera for this. I did use a tripod and I used a filter to hold back um, the shutter speed, you know, how long I leave the, how long the image is exposed to get that silky water. But the point is, is kind of, again, seeing something, thinking about how I can like isolate a particular part of something I see and how the camera is going to view it just through practice. And then one last real quick one, this is um, Open Lands by Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Uh, I used to like to go down when the lake was really low back in 2012, 2013, Lake Michigan was at a record low level. 
And a lot of interesting things showed up like this old wooden pier. It's covered with water now because the lake's back three feet above its average height right now, I think. Um, but again, it's just, how do, I, how do I create those images? How do I pull you into that? How do I make that image three-dimensional? So we're gonna touch on some of these ideas about how we can create images that like this. And, and the key thing is like, Elliot Porter says, great compositions bring order out of chaos, meaning there's a lot of things going on. Our, again, our brain and our eyes are very good. We see something and we can like really kind of cut out all the sound, just like if you're reading a book and you're, on, you're in a public space or you're listening to some music and you can kind of isolate all that background noise. Our brain, when we're visualizing, it's looking at something, sees that as well and can do that. So we're gonna talk about the rules of composition. And, and I kind of got my photography start at the Mortar Arboretum as a student. I took a lot of classes with a photographer named Will Clay, who was a professional photographer for, for 40 years, doing books and magazines. And Will said, rule number one, there are no rules in photography. And then rule number two, he'd say, go see rule number one, there are no rules. And, and what I liked, uh, the way Will thought about composition was he talked about the tools of composition. Uh, rather than the rules of composition. So you may have heard that, you know, rules of, you know, rule of thirds. He always liked to rephrase everything as a tool because we're composing something, we're creating something, we're building it. So we're using a tool to build it, just like you might use a tool to, you know, tools to build a house or tools of composition and music, et cetera. Or you can think of them as guides or guideposts or guidelines. So again, there's no hard and fast rules. But one key thing I think that's important in thinking about your images and how you create them is, is great photographers work on simplifying compositions. They find like, you know, a key, a key subject, like it could be a leading line or a path or a trail, or it could be an object of some sort. And how do we like focus our, our viewers attention on that subject or that key part of it? So how do we simplify that composition? Um, it's just as important what you leave in the frame as what you leave out. So that's something to think about because we we're taking order from that chaos or all those things we see, right? And trying to create a composition from it. And uh, a website I like to check out once in a while is one by this guy named Ken Rockwell. And if you go to Ken's website, you'll see, it looks like he does a lot of um, camera reviews and he does. That's kind of his, his main feature thing to draw people in, but he has a lot of great, um, pages on composition. And he likes to come up, you know, in helping people think about composition, he likes to come up with these kind of goofy, um, you know, acronyms. So for simplification and exclusion, which is what I'm getting at here about this idea of how do we simplify the composition? What do we leave in? What do we exclude? He uses this acronym SEC. So if you have a hard time remembering that idea, a simplification exclusion, you can think of SEC. But I would encourage you to go to Ken's site, take a look. He's got a lot of great ideas about composition. So again, composition is, you know, the organization of all the elements within the image. And what you leave out is as important as what you leave in. So this is, um, you know, a composition I made in, in, in my early days of uh, photography when I got serious about it at the St. James Farm, which is near Cantini in, in Warrenville. And, uh, you know, it's kind of obviously very late in the fall. So there wasn't a lot of leaves. So I, I didn't want to put a lot of the sky in, um, but I wanted to use this, the, the leading lines of the fence post to kind of lead you down this path, down this lane. And, and I like that shadow on the left that kind of, you know, mirrored that image of the, the fence line leading you down there. And it's, what's nice, what works well, I think in this kind of image is um, the leading line leads you into it. It gives you a sense of depth because our photographs are inherently two-dimensional. So things like this that can make it three-dimensional in any way we can give the viewer clues visually to think about the image helps to bring that, that, that image to life. But I had to kind of choose where I wanted like the trunk of that lower left tree, the trunk of the far tree to the right, how I wanted those things within the frame. Uh, I might've done this, you know, uh, unfortunately, they've built a um, parking lot to the left, so I haven't gone back to try to recreate this image. I would also encourage you at any time you find a great composition, 
go back and do it at different times of the year. You'll never stand in the same place. So it'll never exactly be uh, the same composition. I guess with GPS, you could pinpoint where you were standing, uh, but you'll never be exactly the same you know, day, the, the same time. Uh, Earth will not be in the same place in the universe. So something will have be a little bit different. But I would encourage you to go back, do different seasons, you know, try, you know, spring, fall, winter, et cetera. Try different compositions because that helps you to grow and practice and develop your sense of composition and develop your kind of camera eye. So uh, one other quote uh, by Cartier Brisson, he said, 25 years have passed since I started to look through my viewfinder. Uh, but I still re I regard myself as an amateur, though I'm still no longer a dilettante. So he, all he's saying is I'm very serious about photography, uh, but he doesn't consider himself, you know, a professional. And the point is, it's just you keep working at it. You know, if you can go out once a week, once a month, whatever, just get out uh, and 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 look for images to take. So just I want to touch on uh, this idea of inspiration. So um, there's a quote from a Woody Allen movie, and I thought it was like. 90%, uh, but I think he says something like 80% is like showing up or being there. 80% 80, 80 of success is showing up. And that's really a key thing. If you read about inspiration in the field of art um, or any creative area, it's not about like sitting at home and pondering, you know, oh, how can I create this great image? It's just going out and doing the work. So I really strongly encourage you to go out and start photographing and experimenting and look at those images when you get back home. Uh, you know, what images do you like? Why do you like that one? How did that, how, what is it in the image that works that make you like it? So the inspiration is not, as I said, it's not going to come from sitting at home, but it's going to come from being out in the field, doing the work and, and practicing and seeing what catches your eye. Everybody has, you know, we can develop, all of us can improve our visual acuity uh, to create our, our compositions and images, but unless we get out and practice, uh, we're not going to, it's not going to develop as quickly. The great thing with all of our new cameras, um, unless you're still using film, which is cool, is with digital, you immediately see your composition. Now, you don't know if it's in focus because the screens are really small, but at least you'll get a sense of what your composition is like. And you can on the spot start experimenting with the placement of subjects and, and altering your composition. Uh, and by creating a lot of images over time, you get to see it helps you to see like your camera. Now you're never gonna exactly see like your camera because our eyes have a very wide angle of view. We have infinite depth of focus, meaning like everything, you know, uh, if, if we're wearing glasses or contacts, like I wear contacts, so my contacts are corrected, right? But everything looks in focus. As I look at something in the distance, it all looks in focus. So, um, and, and I can see, you know, very wide. So it's not, we're never gonna see exactly like our camera, but we'll kind of think about like, well, what will the camera see? So when you're out, you know, um, looking around, what, what catches your eye? Is it some, you know, a shape, a color, the lighting of the day, uh, some subject or object? Just like that, that image I showed you earlier from uh, the Botanic Garden, where I took the images of the reflection of the birch trees in the water. It was really just the, kind of that color and that shape and the, the very, you know, very little bit of uh, waves on the water. And the other thing that's good for composition is look at other people's images and think about like, well, is there some place similar to something I see or how could I create uh, an image like this? And that's always a good way to develop your, your visual acuity and your compositional ideas is like looking at other, other photographers work and then going out and trying it, stealing from it. So uh, I know there's some quote, somebody said maybe Pablo Picasso said something like uh, good artists borrow and great artists steal. I think Steve Jobs uh, hijack that uh, idea and that that's something like what that quote goes by. But I really believe that it can it can really help your compositional ideas. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about in, in the idea of composition, and this will, I think, really help raise your your compositional, you know, your acuity and thinking about your photography and 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 improve your composition is this idea of corners and edges. It's a very simple idea, very simple technique. So simply once you've found something you wanna take a photograph of, uh, you've created that, you've found your composition, you're ready to create the images. Just before you snap it, 
you look around at the corners of your viewfinder, the back of your, your smartphone, and you look for things that are distracting. So like we've seen all those photographs where we've got, you know, Uncle, you know, Bob, and there's like a telephone pole sticking out of his head. If we would have just, you know, moved him over, put his head in a clear space, it would have been a much better image. So things like that. So if you see distracting elements, so it might be like a little brush sticking by the side or the trunk of a tree on the edge of the frame. I, I don't personally like kind of a trunk split in the middle. I like the trunk over one way or completely out of the frame. Um, but look for those things. Can you reframe the image? Can you move your, your image around in the camera just a little bit uh, without changing the composition too much to remove anything that's distracting? Or uh, if, you know, in your photography path, you start doing post-image processing, like with Lightroom or Photoshop or some other image editing software, you can sometimes take those out, but there's not too much uh, to work on. But look around the edges of your view viewfinders for anything that's distracting. Do you see anything? Are subjects too close? Do they need a little more space to breathe? Are there any really bright spots or dark spots? Because our eyes are sometimes attracted to something very bright, like a bright sky or a, a plain gray sky or a very blue sky. I mean, it's great to have a blue sky. Not as interesting, in my opinion, for photography. But are there any bright or dark distracting areas? What does the sky look like? Is that going to help your composition or, or take away from your composition? So this is a, an image um, I took at the Chicago Botanic Garden. They, um, I haven't been to this part of the garden this year near the English Wall Garden to see if they're do, growing poppies. But for many years, they'd always uh, plant these poppies. And it'd just be you know lots of fun colors and, and make nice textures. And what I did in this frame was uh, I, I looked, the sky was just, I think it was a you know bright, blue, beautiful day, but the sky wasn't going to add anything to the composition. So I purposely did not include any sky. I framed up so I didn't include any sky. And the tree on the left, I left some space of the trunk. And the far tree on the right, again, I left, I purposely created the frame such that those three trees are in the frame, but none of them are touching close to the edge of it. And then I thought it would be nice to have that little path uh, as kind of a leading, a little bit of a leading line, it gives your, your eye a place to start and kind of lead you into the image as you walk across. So the key thing with that was, it was really about colors and textures in this. The path gave it a little bit of a three-dimensional, gave it a little more depth to it because it, you can, you know, your mind knows that you're leading into a path. But I just kind of looked around at the, the edges. Again, I didn't mind where the, the, um, the trees, like the rest of the trees, like, were cut off, so to speak. It didn't matter as long as I left some space um, on the, the edges of the left and right frames. So the canopy of the trees, I didn't mind cutting off. Um, and the sky was not interesting. But I do like sometimes to put little things, you know, like a path or something, if I can, in a corner. I like to put it at a little bit of an angle to give it a little, what I call a little more dynamic feel to it. It gives it a little more motion. It's not quite as static. When you, if you square things up, I mean, it depends on the image because you can certainly have a path or a roadway. Like there's a lot of cool photos of like roadways out west where they're the cameras, you know, the photographer sat right in the middle of the road and it kind of leads you off into a cool valley or up a mountain or whatever. But a lot of times I don't, I, I don't want to square up certain kinds of leading lines like that. Uh, I think it makes it look a little more dynamic, a little less static. And then this next image is also at the Botanic Garden. It's at the Japanese Garden. So the first island, there's these uh, houses. And if you walk down towards the water, um, uh, you'll see these three rocks. They're still there. Um, and and I've no, I know these three rocks for a long time. And I always try to think like, well, how can I create a composition out of those? So if you look again, if you look around the corners and the edges, you can see it's very uh, simplified. There's nothing in the corners of the edges to like distract from you. So I look carefully like where I placed that tree on the left. So I tried not to touch the very edge of the frame. And the same with that willow on the right, I left a little space over there. And then uh, something I'll talk about in a second, convergence notes, I left some space around the two farther rocks and, the, and there's some space between the rock and the top of the willow. And luckily, some light was popping up uh, over the, there's like some hedges behind me, and it lit the front of that first rock. So it just came out really nice um, uh, with uh, that composition, nice colors, early morning light, uh, et cetera. But again, 
I framed it up so I left space for that rock in the bottom right corner. So space, uh, the, in this instance, I didn't want the willow to touch any part of that upper right corner. And then finally, a very simplified image um, is uh, from Rosewood Beach here in Highland Park. Um, there used to be this pier that you could walk out on. There used to be a, like a, a fence that went around it and you could walk out. And over the years, it fell into disrepair. And finally, they remodeled the beach a few years ago and took away all my good uh, compositional areas. But uh, I thought, you know, I thought, well, I could create a very simplified composition here. So this is an example, again, right, of a simplified composition. It's kind of about the colors and the textures. It's a late, probably early evening in the fall, uh, October-ish, little pinks and blues in the sky, some clouds. Um, and again, I looked to make sure there was nothing distracting uh, within the frame. And then I also made sure to leave some space between the end of the pier and the horizon of the waterline. And then this was an image I took at the uh, Morton Arboretum in Lyle near Lake Marmo. And I was walking around uh, the lake shore. And this was over in the shade in November. And it was still frost on the ground. And I found these leaves. And I kept looking around. I found this yellow leaf that, that was loose uh, among all this, the other uh, foliage there, just sitting there. And I just took my camera and pointed it straight down and uh, framed up kind of where I wanted to place that. But again, it was just kind of looking around, trying to minimize anything I thought might be distracting around the edges. And then this was also at the Morton Arboretum, um, the children's garden. So again, uh, the sky was uninteresting. And I, and I just looked for how could I simplify this composition? I could, did convert it to black and white. And what was interesting to me was in the path, the shadow of those like kind of piers, there's a little pond to the left. And so the repeating line of the, that shadow is kind of interesting. And, it, and with the, the path with a little bit of a curve, it gives it a leading line that gives it that three-dimensional uh, ability. So I tried to make sure like that far pier in the upper left had a little space, could, maybe could have used just a tad more, uh, but I didn't want to lose too much um, of the bench. I think I, I, as I played around with that composition, if I moved a little to the left and I, some of the foliage like blocked out the bench because I liked having uh, that bench in the image. And then of course you guys saw this, this image earlier, which I talked about at St. James Farm. Uh, and again, uh, this is in my earlier days. It's a good example though to look at. Um, I think I needed a little more space on the left and the right, in my opinion, now as I look at it, if the, those two tree trunks feel a little crowded. Um, but those are the little things, right? Like, I think I, I like this composition. It's a nice fall, late fall composition. There's a little color left, that leading uh, path. There's actually a bench at the very end you can barely make out. Um, I think it, that's a, it's a fun and interesting composition. You know, if I was to do it again with more experience, I probably would have left just a little more space with those tree trunks on the left and the right. So, so that's one idea to think about when you find the composition is like, where do I want to place those elements, right, in the composition? You know, I, you know, I put the yellow leaf. We'll talk about this in a second about kind of placing where to place things, where to place the horizon. Right again, you can see here, I let the pier out. It kind of goes at a little bit of an angle, I don't know, 22 degrees or something like that to give it a little more dynamic range. Same with the, the rocks. I could have squared up those rocks, but I wanted to have, it gives you a place to kind of start and your, your eye will follow across to that far tree and then maybe across the shore of the willow. Um, but I wanted to leave enough breathing space around uh, the rock in the bottom left, bottom right, sorry, and then the trees on, on the edges. But that's the idea. You find something you're interested in photographing. How can I make it interesting? How do I, how can I see what the camera is going to see? Because I'll tell you, uh, there was a lot of photos, like for example, where those top two rocks, they, in the image, they touched each other. And I thought that really kind of um, made the, the image not as strong. So I'm going to pause for a second about this idea of uh, you know, simplification and, and exclusion and the idea of corners and edges and ask if anybody has any questions or comments or want me to go back over any of the images. You guys might have to unmute.
Any? All right, the auction's running out. All right, if there's no questions, I'll, I'll go on. So again, I will say real quickly, all the, these images I did shoot with a DSLR, all of them could have been um, composed in one way or another with um, a smartphone or a point and shoot camera. So again, it's not really the equipment that's important, but how you see something and how you think about framing it up. All right, so a related topic kind of um, in composition is this idea of convergence, right? You know, it's related to the topic of edges and corners. And, and convergence, which I've already kind of touched on, is about leaving space around elements in the image. So you either decide, do I want those elements to touch? Is that okay? Is there some reason to do it? Or do I want to avoid the convergence? Does that touching or convergence add to the composition, detract, or doesn't do anything? So as I mentioned in this composition, I put a couple red ovals just to point out specifically, you know, besides the corner itself, right, the corners and the edges of the frame not touching anything, I wanted to make sure there was some breathing space between that lower, uh, larger rock in the right and the top of the, the reflection of the willow tree. So it's really important that I could find a place with my camera that there was space. And the same with those two rocks, uh, in the, at the top, the smaller ones are in the middle of the screen. Because uh, I've taken other images there on different days. I've, I've gone back and photographed this, you know, these three rocks a couple different times. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I can do the cop, this photograph anymore because that willow was um, ripped in half last year by a storm and then they finally took the whole thing out. So there's nothing there. So I don't think, I'll have to go back and see if I can find a different composition. But uh, I had taken other compositions over the years, other photographs, and and you know the first ones, you know, I, I was very excited because I thought, wow, I, what could I do? The, what did I do? And then I got home and I looked at them on the big screen. It's like ah, those two rocks are touching. It just doesn't look as good. They needed some space to breathe. And the same with this pier. Um, I thought it was important to leave some breathing space between the horizon. I think it would have made it a less strong composition if there was convergence of that end of the pier with the horizon. So I wanted to leave some space there. All right, so probably one of the best known uh, tool of composition or rule, uh, I like to think of it as a tool, uh, is the, the idea of the tool of thirds or rule of thirds. And you simply divide your picture by thirds horizontally and vertically, and then you frame key subjects at the cross points. Um, they don't like that, but I'm going to jump down to the bottom bullet point for a second. You don't have to be exactly in a third. There's no hard requirement here. It can be in the vicinity of a third. It depends on your composition, what you want to do with it. Um, now, uh, smartphones will often let you put up the rule of thirds grid lines, and there's nothing wrong. I use it all the time, just, uh, just to kind of see. I'll look, create my composition, and I'd like to see like, oh, well, how did it end up? You know, where did it fall in that? You know, just... Uh, out of curiosity. So you can often turn on a rule of thirds grid in your viewfinder on your camera um, or on the back of your camera or on your smartphone. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using that just as a guideline. Again, there's no hard rules on how you place it. So Lake Marmo, I was looking to make a simple composition. I was watching this uh, yellow oak leaf or brownish gold oak leaf kind of drift along the water. Um, behind the backdrop of the pine trees that are green and the blue water. And I think, you know, like I waited till I got to this point and uh, created that image. And again, it's a very simplified image, you know, very nothing distracting in the corners uh, or the edges along the space. And it ended up, um, I, the camera I had at the time did not have a grid that turned on the rule of thirds, but I just kind of like eyeballed where I wanted it. If it was in the middle of the frame, uh, it wouldn't give you, you know, the, the nice, uh, there's a little bit of an angle across the top of those pines. That wouldn't have uh, came out as well, and I think it would have been a little more static, but it just, oops, happened to hit kind of right around the third. And then you can use it for also like horizons and stuff. So this is an image I took at um, Lake Forest, uh, Lake Forest, Forest Preserve, Lake County Forest Preserve, Fort Sheridan. And uh, what, and I converted it to black and white um, 
from my digital image and color. And what, com what, what I was interested in was these clouds. I thought, wow, these are really awesome clouds. They're just so beautiful. Um, and, and down along the beach there, uh, for whatever reason, there's some broken concrete that they dumped in the water. And again, this was when the water levels were lower. I don't think you would see that broken concrete, but for all intents and purposes, it looks like it, it's just a chunk of rock that's uh, sitting in the water. I thought, well, I can use it as an anchor point. That'll just give it help with, you know, kind of a visual anchor point to start with, add a little more interest to the composition. And again, you can see I gave it some space uh, in, that, in that lower right-hand uh, corner. Um, and you can see the horizons roughly at a third. Now, my preference in this image, um, and I couldn't do this, would I would have maybe the horizon instead of at a third, maybe at one sixth, because I thought the clouds were the interesting part, less so the water and the rock, but I wanted that anchor point. And you can see that the rock is not uh, in uh, on any of the lines, but the horizon is at a third. So that's another powerful tool that you can use in composition. No hard, fast rules. So we'll take a look at some of the other images we look. And you can see here that the lower rock kind of hits on the third. And, and you can see that the horizon or where the water kind of meets the shoreline is roughly a third-ish. So there's about a third of the two-thirds of water and one-third-ish of land sky. And again, uh, it ended up that way partially because, I, as I said, I wanted to leave space for the willow in the upper right corner. Uh, and, and of course, I didn't want you know, different parts of that, that touching. So here we look at this one. Now here, you can see that the horizon is slightly above the third. So no hard, fast rules. And you can see here like almost nothing like matches up on that rule of thirds, rule of thirds. So the, the bench kind of does. This image is because it's more of about a leading line or a, a slow, like a little bit of an S curve. You can see that's like makes a little bit of an S and curves like that, C curves, reverse C curves, S curves, reverse S curves are always good uh, to use in compositions as leading lines or th something that leads a person into the composition because it gives them a sense of depth and makes your three-dimensional image, your two-dimensional photograph have a three-dimensional feel. And then you can see here the, the, the main yellow leaf. So this is a more abstract, right? It's a flat image. There's no real depth to it. It's just about colors and textures and the contrast with the frost and the shapes and how the frost really more sharply cuts the shape of the, the different leaves and foliage. Uh, you can see that the leaf is kind of in the hitting on the third right. So I did want to put that leaf in the lower right to make it a little more dynamic um, image. I think it makes it, personally, I think it makes it a more dynamic image. Uh, and I also made sure that when I framed it up, now the leaf is just sitting on the ground. So I could have made the leaf, you know, stand straight up or whatever. I just wanted to give it that little bit of that gentle angle again, because I think that makes the image have a sense of it's being more dynamic. It's not as static. If I would have squared it up or did something else, it might have been uh, more static. But if you find a composition like this, um, then you know work with it. Try putting the leaf in different parts of the the image. You know maybe put it in the upper right or the upper left. You know see how it feels, like how the space is. Does it? Since the leaf, the way I positioned it, it's kind of looking to the upper left, uh, like in in photography of of wildlife. If you have uh, a bird or an animal looking to the left, you'd want to leave more space on the left. You want to give them some breathing room. If you put their like their beak, if they're looking to the left of the frame, like this is pointing to the left, if you put it way on the left side, that'll add a lot of tension. It'll make it, uh, it just doesn't feel quite right. You'll, you, you won't know exactly what's, what's wrong, but it just feels really tight when there's no space for them to kind of look out to. So, that would apply to people if you're doing portraits and people are looking to you know one side, or if you're doing wildlife, birds, or or uh, you know animals of any sort. So any questions around? Maybe if you've all are more familiar with this idea, the tool of thirds, rule of thirds. I don't know if you guys have thought about that or how you might use those in your compositions. Any questions around that? All right, very quiet group. 
All right. Uh, so we're going to talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here in a second, but uh, Robert Adams is a great photographer out West. I always like this. Uh, I think he still shoots film, but certainly he started in the 60s doing photography, so he certainly did film. And I always like this quote, no place is boring if you've had a good night's sleep and a pocket full of unexposed film. So now we'd say, uh, you know, a couple of uh, formatted memory cards ready to go. All right, so the other thing um, to think about in the composition, so, so we touched on the idea of corners and edges, right? Making sure there's no distracting elements. I'll just take your compositions and raise them to the next higher level of, of image creation. And again, your images, you know, this is my kind of, you know, thoughts and ideas on compositions. There's many different ways to look at it and think about it. And the key thing is like, your images have to be pleasing to you first and foremost, right? Um, but hopefully that gives you some other ideas about when you're creating your compositions, how you can raise your, your visual acuity and your art form, so to speak. Um, but besides, so we touch on corners and edges and this idea of convergence, which is related to corner, corners and edges. And we touched on the idea of tool of third. So those, just those couple, three things, which aren't too hard to remember uh, when you're out photographing, right? And, and thinking about how do I simplify my composition? Those are things that'll take your composition a long way and give you a lot of tools to work with and practice for a very long time. But the other thing is lighting, right? What is the lighting like? Because photography is, I think it's, I always forget, Greek or Latin for uh, photo light writing, photograph. Um, so when we, we look at lighting, uh, we can use lighting as part of our composition, right? So there's, there's uh, different ways the light comes in, right? There's front light, side light, back light. So a front lit means that the light is really behind you. It's lighting the subject up in front of you. And side light, of course, you know, the light is coming from the, you know, the, the, the sides or backlit, uh, whereas the, like the sun on a, on a sunset or sunrise on a beach or something where the light is, you're photographing in the light. That's what it's meant by backlit or backlighting. And then the quality of the light changes. It changes by the season and by the time of the day and everything else that's going on. If it's overcast, you have a very soft, diffuse lighting. It has a little bit of a blue tint to it. Nothing wrong with that. It's often good for photographing vegetation and stuff, flowers. Um, sunrise, sunset have those really warm yellow, orange tones. Twilight has a little bit of that blue tone. Early morning, late afternoon, you know, the sun's a little higher, so it's a little golden, um, a bit of a gold tone sometimes. Depends on the, the, the time of year too. And then midday when the sun's very overhead, the sky, that's, it's a very bright, um, very bright light with a bluish tint to it. Now our cameras might pick up that a little bit. Our eyes adjust, you know, really well. So for example, uh, a light, you know, here's a sunny day. Uh, sun's not quite overhead, but uh, probably later morning. And you can see uh, there's more shadows. Uh, nothing wrong with it. This is at the um, this is the I, the bridge to the Japanese Garden at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but you just you have to kind of look at your shadows. Like in this image, I don't think it distracts uh, from the the composition. Um, but on some days where they're very you know where the, when it's very bright and the shadows are very dark, very harsh, it can be distracting. So conversely, you know, this is what it might look like on an overcast day. So this isn't exactly the same composition, pretty close. As I said, you're always not in the exact same place, but you can see it, it renders it differently. So in the first one, right, we have some very bright spots and some very dark shadows, like underneath the, the bridge on the far side. It's almost pure black there. Whereas here, there's some black, but we see some more detail, right? And the foliage is more evenly lit. So nothing wrong with photographing on an overcast day, just something to keep in mind. And then sunrise, this is at Rosewood Beach, again, uh, when the lake was in 2012, 2013-ish, when the lake, the water was three feet below the average. You can see some of these old piers, but it's very, very contrasty because I'm shooting into the sun. The sun's super bright. You can only can kind of control the blob, how big it is. Um, but you have those really orange and yellow and red tones that, that are so cool in the, in the sunrise. Uh, and then also the same at sunset, right? We got some really warm uh, pink 
uh, in yellow and orange tones. So this is at the uh, North Lake at the Chicago Botanic Garden. There's, um, I can't think of what uh, it's, but if there's a little uh, like area you can sit and look at over the North Lake and they often have this fountain and they light it up at night. Now, um, most of my photography work, I do, I do take a lot of images with my smartphone, but I use a camera, I put it on a tripod. The tripod allows me to use, you know, other filters uh, and get really slow shutter speeds. So you can see this like is a 20 second exposure. Uh, and that's how I got that very smooth, silky water effect. And, you know, uh, compositionally, you know, I pushed that um, fountain to the far left. The wind was kind of blowing across to the right. Uh, and then I split, you can see kind of it's split in half. So it's not exactly, you know, on the line of the third on the, on the left, because um, I wanted to get as much of the sky and the clouds and the reflection, the mirror image. And then this is, um, I don't know if it shows up across on your monitors. It kind of depends on how your monitor's set up, but this is the Evening Island Bridge at the Chicago Botanic Garden. I was trying to get a nice I, I never get over there at the right time to get you know a shot with the moon. So anyway, that was my goal. That was in the fall, and that's at twilight. So the sun is set, but the light actually still at twilight. The light of the sun is bending along the curvature of the Earth, so you do get a little bit of 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 light. But it's got those more of those blue tones, and then uh, early morning light uh, at Rosewood Beach. So we got more golden tones, longer shadows. So the sun is above the horizon. Um, you know, I'd gone down there to photograph and, and this was like actually a little bit of property just south of Rosewood Beach proper. It's probably, it's private property. And they have these concrete barriers there to help keep the beach from washing away. And what kind of caught my eye was that how the water would come and sit on top of the sand and make kind of that silver reflection. Uh, Cause it wasn't, the sky wasn't super interesting to me that day. So that's kind of, that's what I had in mind when I made that composition. Those little blocks make kind of a leading line leading you towards the far end of the beach. And, and you can see the sky's not super interesting, so I didn't put a lot of sky in about a third. But again, I'm always thinking about like, how can I simplify it? What can I exclude? Or what part of the, how much of the shoreline do I choose to show, et cetera. And I did shoot it on a tripod to get those slower shutter speeds to get that kind of, I like that kind of smooth wave look. And we've seen this image. Uh, again, that was again a late morning, so it's you know still some golden tones uh, in the fall. So often the fall is a good time to photograph uh, or sp in spring. And then this was more midday. You can see the shadows are almost overhead, um, and and I don't think there were any clouds that day. Yeah. So, but that just gives you some ideas about um, the use of light in your images. So it doesn't hurt to think about because that can really make a big difference in an image is, is the quality of the light, where the light's coming in, et cetera. Any questions around those ideas of light? So something just to keep in mind. All right. So when you go out to photograph, the next time you're doing nature and landscape photography, wherever it might be, you know, think about do you have a key subject or subjects that you want to photograph that you want to emphasize in your image? You know, uh, you know, what is the subject that you want to set your focus point on? So uh, what do you want? What's, what do you think is kind of the most important or key thing? And then think about how you might frame that up. And then look around at the corners and edges. You know, are there bright spots, dark spots? spots? What does the sky look like? Does the sky help? Does it not help? Uh, you can try the tool of thirds you know, and framing up that image. And then you can also think about the light, the direction and the quality. You know, is that helping the composition or creating a distraction? So one, one exercise you might do, <clears throat> and I was just out for a walk and I was thinking about, you know, my, an upcoming class. And I thought, you know, I had this discussion with students about tool of thirds and framing up things. I thought like, well, a good exercise is like, you know, you pick something uh, that's a, a, more of a key subject, and then you can put it in different parts of the frame. So this was done with my smartphone. The idea is trying to put that tree, if you look at the middle picture, the tree in the middle is kind of my key subject. So this is the, I think that's called Marsh Island, and that's out on the prairie at the Chicago Botanic Garden. But you can see if you go from the left to right at the top of the frame, it's in the kind of the upper right third, and then the middle third, you know, the middle and then the last. So it's kind of moving it around. 
Not exactly, right? And seeing like, what compositions do you like? Um, and that's a good exercise uh, to do. Because like I said, it doesn't cost you anything extra to take. Like, is the sky more interesting or is the water more interesting? So actually out of all these compositions, if I was gonna create a composition, it might look more like this. Now, I thought this like smoky cloud here was interesting, but, um, and, and I was out for a walk, so I wasn't super thinking about <laughs> um, creating a, you know, this is more of, like I said, an exercise for my students to think about. And you can try this, right? And when you go out to photograph, but this is probably the composition I would like the best. I would like a little more of that smoky cloud. I'd have to think, you know, again, I was in a bit of a hurry, but, um, it's, I'm kind of splitting the, the image in half, not quite. So the horizon's not, it's below the halfway point because I like that smoky cloud, but I didn't, I, I didn't like the tree. I didn't really like any of these so much, right? I didn't like it split kind of really in the middle. Uh, and I didn't like it where there was no water. Um, I kind of liked having the water there. Maybe that bottom right third one would be another choice. I, I maybe I'll have to make it bigger and see what I think, because I like that kind of little smoky cloud that was hanging over the tree. But that's kind of the image I like the best uh, that I took. I took one extra image. And again, you can see I love space around the reflection of the, the canopy of the tree there. So uh, the way I typically work, so either, you know, I'm either photographing with my smartphone, which, which I happen to be an Apple fan, and, and, and I don't use any of Apple's, anything other than the photo app that comes with the Apple software or the Apple phone. And I, the only thing I do is like, you can press on what you want on focus. So in this image, I tap the screen and, and make sure it focuses on that tree because I want to make sure that tree was in sharp focus. And that's the only thing I do. And in fact, I, I use the little button on, you know, the, it makes a vi virtual button. I press that button to do it. it. You know, some folks have said, well, why don't you, you can tell your phone to take the picture. It's like, I guess I could, it's old habits, die hard. Or I could use like one of the side buttons, but I just like hit, hit where I want the focus point and then I take the picture. And you can do post-processing right in the, the camera. It's got a really powerful editing tool that you can use. But otherwise, uh, just for information, if I'm photographing with a camera, um, I was a long time Nikon user recently, I've been trying um, Sony, uh, Sony camera, that's a mirrorless camera. I shoot in what's called aperture priority mode, so I control the aperture and the depth of focus. And usually I do what's called autofocus sing uh, single, and I use, I select the autofocus point so I make my composition, pick what I want as a focus point, and I use the back button to set that, and then I don't have to touch anything on the camera. And then I use a remote shutter release because I use a tripod. So I know tripods are kind of a hassle if, if you're a person that you know is using some, some camera other than your smartphone or a point and shoot. But the tripod forces you to slow down and think about your composition and also to help you make more sharper images and then you can let the shutter speed be slower to get kind of the, do different kind of effects with that silkiness in the water. And then, you know, like for focal length ranges, just if you're curious, I like, you know, 24 to 100 range uh, is kind of the focal length I like. And, and then our newer cameras have some sort of vibration reduction. When it's on a tripod, I, you turn that off because otherwise that can actually make your image a little bit less sharp. And I use a tripod, like I said, and a remote release. So in case you ever uh, decide to, to take your images and put them in a show somewhere, either you know, a solo portfolio or a, um, you know, a portfolio or a portfolio and exhibit you're working with other people, you might have to write an artist statement. So I just thought for inspiration, I would close with this idea of you know, Calvin and Hobbes, if you guys are familiar with Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin Hobbes is Calvin's a little kid and Hobbes is uh, actually stuffed tiger who he imagines is alive. And he says, as my artist statement explains, my work is utterly incomprehensible and is therefore full of deep significance. So that's kind of the end. I wasn't sure I have a lot more slides um, that I added that you can you know, take a look at some other uh, tools and techniques and ideas of composition because I wasn't sure how fast or, or slow we would get through this. So, um, so really right now this, I, I'm happy to look at a few other slides. Um, I didn't know if anybody else had, if anyone had any other questions. I know sometimes in a virtual uh, Zoom 
uh, folks are a little reluctant, but this would be, if you have any questions, a good time to uh, ask any questions you can pop on screen or unmute. Anything in the chat, Jen, or? No, nope, no, nope, nothing in the chat. I guess people might be happy to. Just listen. <laughs> just be listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we got a couple more minutes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just yep. go through a couple more slides just to give you some other ideas real quickly. About... All right. So, so there's this thing called focal length. All cameras have, um, almost all cameras have um, different focal lengths. When I say cameras, I include your smartphones. So a lot of the newer smartphones have two or three cameras built in those three little lenses. And, and focal length does a couple things for you. And you can use this as part of your creative elements and composition. So focal length will determine the field of view what, from how much the camera sees left or right. And then how much it brings the background in, compresses it. So it brings background elements closer or expands it, pushes them away. So when you zoom in or you use a, a, a lens that looks like it brings everything closer, it's actually doing two things, narrowing how much it sees left or right, or you know if you tip it sideways up top to bottom, and how close the background elements come in. And then if you go to a lens that pushes it away, on either you know if you have a regular camera and you zoom out, or on your smartphone, you pick one of those wide angle lenses, it, it, it makes the angle of view wider, but it pushes the background elements farther away. And focal length is simply the distance between the front of the lens and wherever that your sensor is on your camera. And, and then there's just a little, from Nikon, I like this shot, so I thought it'd be easy. You could see the field of view. Our eyes have about you know 180 degrees field of view. Um, so just as an example, you know, with my regular camera, because it was easier to illustrate, I, I took a series of images where I tried to keep the tree on the left, kind of the same size and the same place in the composition. So that means I had to physically move backwards and forwards, because if I stood in one place, the tree would get really close or go way far away. So that you could see the effect of the focal length in your composition. So here's kind of the starting point, 50 millimeters. And you can see the bell tower at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And then I went wider. That means I, I twisted my lens or I picked it, I'd pick on my smartphone the wider angle. And you can see how like you see more stuff on the left. I tried to keep the tree in the same place, but you can see how the bell tower moves farther away. And we see more of the sky and we can see some separation of that lily pad uh, there in the water. So there's 50 millimeters and then there's going wider. So now we're gonna go the other, we're gonna start bringing it in. So now I went to 70 millimeters and you can see how the bell tower gets closer and we, and the, and the lilies, the water lily pads, where those are, get really close. Almost, they almost look like it's right up against the shore. And then back to 50. And then I went to 135. Now you're not going to get as much range necessarily on your smartphone, but you'll get some range like this. So I had to, I physically stepped back. I couldn't go any, this is at 135 millimeters. I couldn't go any farther back physically because I ran into some bushes. But you can see now, like from here, how close the bell tower is. And that those flowers, those little water lilies or whatever they are, uh, are like, they just look like part of the foreground scenery. And then you can see how the tree, we don't see all the detail in the tree because we lose the background of the sky. But you can, maybe you like that image. Maybe you wanted to bring those flowers forward and you wanted a little bit of the, the bell tower in the image. But you can use focal length. So on your smartphone, you might have one or two, two or three lenses. If you have one, you can't do this. Zooming in does not do it. If you like take it and zoom in, it's a it's an optical uh, capability. It's not the zoom doesn't do the same. Like if you pinch and zoom your, your image, it doesn't have the same effect. But you can see then, can I put them side by side again so you could kind of see the effect. So you can also use those in, in composition, right? So I did this with my smartphone uh, earlier this year for a, a class I was teaching at the Botanic Garden. Now I didn't exactly frame everything up in the same exact location, but this is a wider angle shot. And then this is a, a little more of a telephoto shot. So if you look on the right, actually, so there's a this, um, oops, sorry. There's like some ground cover, like in the middle right of that image, um, or a rock. 
you, you can see how it's all, everything's pushed away. So that if you kind of look at that and then you look what's in the far distant, you can see how it brings, oops, sorry, all the shoreline closer. So again, the idea is that it's really compressing that background just brings everything in tighter. So uh, not that one composition is, I think they're both kind of interesting and, and cool compositions, but you can use this idea of focal length uh, to change your compositions as well. And that's available in any, you know, uh, any camera, um, like point and shoot cameras usually have some sort of, you know, zoom. And again, they'll have an optical zoom and a digital zoom. If you're using the digital zoom, it, you don't, you're just really cutting the part of the picture out is what you're doing. You're not really, it's not the optical. It's not giving the same effect as changing the focal length. So anytime you're doing an optical zoom, whether it's on your smartphone or your point and shoot camera or your DSLR or your mirrorless camera or your film camera, whatever, you're gonna get that kind of effect. So that's another thing you can use and think about in, um, in composition. And I think, I think that's where we'll stop. Okay, I have a couple of questions oh, in the chat now. Great. Okay, one is, um, let me see who it's from, let's see. Uh, Elaine, it looks like maybe, uh, says, do you ever crop your photos? Well, that's a really great question, Elaine, thank you. So Elaine asks, do I ever crop my photos? And um, for the most part, I do not crop. Um, because, <laughs> so Will Clay, who's a big influence on my photography, said like, Will always said, photograph with intent. Uh, always, you know, try if you can, as best as you can, to create a composition that uses your full camera's capabilities. So when you crop, you're actually throwing some of the data away. So that, I, that doesn't mean I don't ever crop. Uh, in fact, if you remember that yellow leaf, I did crop that image because I couldn't get my camera any closer to kind of make what I had in my mind, the end image up. But pretty much I try to compose, like these are uncropped, for example. I kind of tried to compose it in a way that I liked it so that I wouldn't crop it because I'm actually gonna lose some of the quality of the image if I start cropping. So uh, also, and it also forces me, I think, in my opinion, to you know work harder at my compositions. So nothing wrong with cropping. Sometimes you have to do it, but I would, my philosophy is to start with like creating the best composition using the entire frame, whether it's a smartphone or my camera uh, in the field. And it's less work, right? And I don't have to do work afterwards after, when I get back home. All right, uh, the next one is from Michelle. How critical is it to have a tripod for a novice photographer? <laughs> Advantage does it give you? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, Michelle. Thank you. So the question's about the use of a tripod. So again, um, you know, Will was a big advocate of using tripods and, and obviously with my smartphone, I don't carry a tripod. I could, you can get uh, holders that fit on tripods. Um, uh, but I would recommend, you know, for me personally, I almost like 95% of my photography um, I do uh, with my regular camera is with a tripod. Uh, the tripod, again, it, it, it does slow you down, but it does force you to think about your composition a little bit more. I mean, it is, you know, extra work. You got to carry the thing. You got to put your camera on, adjust the legs, and you don't like the height. You know, it is more work. But by using the tripod, it's going to give you a sharper image than handheld because, you know, you're, no matter how good you are. Now, Ken Rockwell, I mentioned earlier, he says he never uses a tripod. I don't know how Ken takes these super sharp images, but somehow he does. For me, I've got to have a tripod. When I'm using a tripod then, then I don't have to worry about the shutter speed because faster shutter speeds handheld will make our images sharper. But when I just put it on a tripod, then I, I don't have to worry about shutter speed. And I like that, that effect. Uh, I'll see if I can find a quick example here. I have to go back, sorry. Like here. So this, I didn't use any anything. Uh, I don't think I used any filters on this, but I was able to do a one and a half second sh exposure because uh, it was sitting on a tripod. I could never have held that still and get the sharpness of the beach with the softness of those waves. And so that's that's the other reason I like using a tripod. I just think it's, it's going to help you um, make sharper images. It does slow you down a little, which will help you work on your composition. And um, tripods have really, you know, there's a lot of Chinese-made tripods that are very good, you know, under 
you know, between 100 and 300 dollars that are carbon fiber, so they're lighter weight and easier to use. Uh, you can look on Amazon or B&H Photo, or you can even look on Ken's site. I think he has occasionally will recommend a, a tripod. Or if you have a question, this is for anything that we discussed tonight or any of the slides, please do send me an email. My email link is on the, the front slide. So hopefully, okay. hopefully that helped, Michelle. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. This was uh, great. And um, we will be posting this recording on our website or on our Facebook. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, we'll put it on our Facebook telling you where it's located, I guess. Um, and uh, so people can view it afterwards as well. So tell your friends. And uh, we just had a great time. Thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was, it was a lot of fun. And hopefully uh, everybody got something out of it. And again, my email's there. Please send me an email. If you don't hear from me in a day or two, just send me a little, you know, reminder and, and I'll be sure to answer that. And uh, if you're ever out, uh, you know, uh, the Chicago Botanic Garden way, you know, I do teach classes out there as well. So uh, they're posted. I don't think we have any, I don't have anything really coming up till the fall. We're kind of, uh, I'm taking a little bit of the summer off, I guess is what to say. But yeah, I'll have some stuff coming up in the fall. Good time to take photos. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect time. Yeah. So thank you all. It was a great, uh, I really enjoyed uh, presenting tonight and hope to see you all again sometime. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.